I don't have a slide presentation for tonight, believe it or not, for two reasons. One is because I'm going to be reading long passages, longer than usual passages from the Torah, and I just think it would, I thought it'd be very hard to uh, paste them and, and scroll through them. And the other reason is because um, I didn't have time to prepare a, uh, a slide presentation for tonight. Maybe that's the real reason, I'm not sure. But either way, if you have a stone chumash nearby, you might want to grab it. If you don't, that's totally fine. Don't worry at all. Or if you have any kind of chumash, you can grab that too, I suppose. Um, okay. So we are going to try to unpack Parshas Ve'eschanan, which is a very, very packed Parsha. Unpacking Parshas Ve'eschanan properly would take two or three cheering, two or three classes, because it is it just, it is so loaded with a lot, a lot, a lot of incredibly fundamental um, Jewish ideas. And, um, and I really just think that, you know, we're gonna get, we're gonna obviously look at some of them, but we're not gonna get to all of it, but I would encourage you between now and Shabbos to try to uh, spend some time going through the Parsha in depth. Um, I wanna just th say thank you to uh, Rabbi Ephraim Goldberg of the Boca Raton Synagogue. Quite a few of the remarks I'm gonna make tonight um, I am I'm going to say over things that I heard him say as well, as well as some other additional things for uh, for Len, who, who, who listens to Rabbi Goldberg, and I don't mind to have to hear them all over again. Okay, so first of all, um, this Parsha is really a continuation of last week's Parsha, and it's Moshe's speech. It's so amazing. It's just the whole Chumash just changes tenor. Right, the first four books of the Torah were by Daber Hashem al Moshe Lemor, and God spoke to Moshe saying it was Hashem speaking to Moshe, Hashem speaking to Moshe all along. And now all of a sudden we're in a whole new type of Chumash um, style, and that is um, Moshe speaking to the people, Moshe sharing his, um, his, his, insights, his wisdom, his final direction, his advice, his rebuke, etc., to the um, to the Jewish people. I'm just responding to these. Um, tonight's learning is going to be a schus for Boshema for Aaron Leah Bashendel, Yudas Ariella, Bash Yochevet, and Avram Ben Sara. Maybe they have a for Shlema. About Eliezer Ben Etarachaleya. Eliezer Ben Etarachaleya. Absolutely. Um, and someone asked the question, is the $250 tuition per person? And that the answer is in the affirmative, yes, $250 per person. I mean, that's what it, I think it always was. I think it may have been two, $200 before, but it went up a little bit. Inflation. Okay. Um, anyway, so uh, Moshe is here. He's delivering his final speech to the final message to the Jewish people. And it says, it starts off by saying, and if you have your stone Chumash here, um, it is, uh, the Parsha begins on page 900 and 958. Eight. I was going to say 59 in the English, 959 in the English or um, Deuteronomy chapter 3, verse 23, if you're using a different Kumash, Parsha says that on. Um, and it starts off by saying that Eschanan al Hashem be'isahi lemor. Moshe is speaking. Moshe says, "I implored Hashem at that time, saying," and it goes on to explain how Moshe implored. I'm going to talk about that that word "implored" in just a moment. He implored Hashem, asking to be able to enter into the land of Israel. Now, "implored" is a very powerful word. Eschanan. There are, the Talmud tells us that there are actually 10 different terms used for tefillah, for prayer. Um, and one of those is implored. And it's a very forceful type of prayer. It's a, it's a real aggressive type of prayer. So Moshe is really aggressively praying to be able to enter into the land of Israel. And in fact, the word v'eschanan, if you... Look at that from a numerological point of view. It 
equals the number 515. And the commentaries tell us that Moshe actually davened 515 times he asked Hashem to be able to be led into the land of Israel, which in and of itself, by the way, is quite a lesson. You know, what do we do? We want something, so we daven for you. Daven once, didn't get it. Oh, man, I'm angry at Hashem. I'm disappointed, or I give up. Or maybe if I'm a, I'm a starker, I'll daven two or three or four times. But eventually, you know, I didn't get it. It's not happening. Hashem clearly doesn't want to give this to me. And I want to stop. Not Moshe. Moshe went on and on and on. 515 times he davens to Hashem to allow him to enter into the land of Israel. And eventually Hashem says no, and um, he's not able to go. Now, what was it about entering the land of Israel that was so important to him? Why was he so, why did he want to go there so badly? What did he want to see? What was he, you know, did he want to go to Yad Vashem? Did he want to have breakfast at the, uh, at the Herbert Samuel Hotel? I mean, that is a definitely a good breakfast. It's worth davening for, I don't know if it's worth davening 515 times. So the commentaries, the Talmud actually points out that no, what Moshe, why did Moshe really want to enter into the land of Israel so badly? Because there are many, many mitzvot in the Torah that you can't do outside of the land of Israel. These are called mitzvot hatulias ba'aretz, mitzvot that are dependent upon being in the land to fulfill. All the agricultural laws are included in that. All of the laws of sacrifices and the daily rituals and the daily sacrifices that took place in the Holy Temple. There are hundreds of mitzvahs in the Torah that you can't perform when you're not in Israel. So Moshe really, really, really wants to go into Israel, into the land of Israel, not because he wants to, you know, see the sites, but because he wants to be able to do the additional mitzvahs. And this tells us something about the importance and the values of mitzvahs. You know, sometimes I think we think of mitzvot as nebuch. You know, we're Jews. What can we do? We have, we have these mitzvahs that we got to fulfill. So we'll do them. We'll get them over with so I can get on with the main purpose of my life, which is fill in the blank. My job, my family, my career, my vacation, whatever it is. But that's not how Moshe looked at mitzvot. Moshe daven 515 times to be able to enter into the land of Israel because there were mitzvot that he wasn't going to be able to do otherwise because Moshe understood that a mitzvah is an opportunity for godly connection. It's an opportunity to create eternity. It's an opportunity, a chance to connect my soul to its source. That's what a mitzvah is. And therefore, he really, really wanted to go in and to be able to perform these mitzvahs. And this is a huge lesson for us. Mitzvahs are opportunities for us to connect in a serious, serious way. You know, every morning we make a bracha. And it's probably the least politically correct bracha that you can imagine until you understand what it means. Every morning we say, Baruch Hashem, Elokeinu Melech Olam Shalom, Asani Goy. Blessed are you, God. Thank you for not making us a Gentile. Now, when you hear that for the first time, you're like, what? That doesn't sound very nice. Thank you for not making me a Gentile. What, are we better than them? We look down on them? God forbid, that's not what's going on. What's going on is an awareness and a recognition that Gentiles also have mitzvos. How many? Seven. Sheva mitzvos, right? And how many do we have? 613. So by being a Jew, that means we have more opportunities to do mitzvot, meaning we have more opportunities to grab eternity, more opportunities to connect our soul to its source and our creator. And that's why we are thanking God for giving us that opportunity. Okay, so he davens 515 times to be able to go into the land of Israel. The answer eventually is no. And as we mentioned a couple of weeks ago, the next thing that happens is kind of strange, right? What happens? God says, you can't go in, but here's what I want you to do. I want you to ascend to the top of the cliff, raise your eyes westward, northward, southward, and eastward, and see with your eyes, for you shall not cross this Jordan, Jordan River. 
And I, and I think I pointed this out in Parsha's Masse, where we saw this for the first time, that that is really strange. Because, um, maybe it was in Parsha's Tim, I can't remember now. But that's really strange, because like, why is Hashem taunting him? You can't go into the land of Israel. You're not going to go in. But you know what I want you to do? I want you to go up and I want you to see it. And see how awesome it is. And see how beautiful it is. Remember we spoke about that? And at the time I answered that what was going on is that Hashem was trying to create within Moshe a deep, the deepest possible yearning to be in the land. Because that was going to be passed on to, through the spiritual DNA from Moshe to the Jewish people. But there's another question. Rabbi Goldberg asked this question. I thought it was really interesting. He's standing on top of the mountain on the east bank of the Jordan River. And he says, look westward, okay? Or first he says, um, where is it? He says, look, yeah, look westward. So if he looks west from there, he's looking towards Jerusalem. He's looking towards Hebron. He's looking towards Shiloh. He's looking towards Tel Aviv, Yafo, towards the Mediterranean, towards the land of Israel. So we get that. Look northward, he's looking towards the Golan. Look southward, he's looking towards Beersheba. And then it says, look eastward which means turn around and look backwards, not to where you're going, but to where you came from. So why does he tell Moshe to turn around and look towards the east? That's not the land of Israel. Eventually it's gonna be part of the land of Israel, but right now that's not the land of Israel. So why was that essential? And he was already there. So why was it important for Moshe to turn eastward? Just say, look westward, northward and southward, and you'll see the land of Israel. And you're not gonna enter, but you'll see it and you'll yearn for it. So but Goldberg said a very nice thought. He said that, you know, we all have dreams. We all have goals. We all have a vision in our life, where we want to be, what we want to achieve. And we don't always achieve it. We don't always reach our goal. We don't always live our dream. We don't always get to accomplish our vision. So what do you do then? You didn't get to, Moshe had a vision. Moshe had a dream. He wanted to lead the Jewish people into the land of Israel. He didn't get to do it. So does that mean that Moshe did nothing? He did. Of course, Moshe did so much. So Shem says, turn around and look eastward and know that even though you're not completing your mission, you're not going to fulfill your ultimate dream and vision of entering into the land of Israel, leading the Jewish people to the land of Israel. But look what you have done. Turn around, look backwards, look where you came from. You led the Jewish people out of the, the slavery in Egypt. You led the Jewish people across the sea and you led them through the desert for 40 years and you fought wars and you won wars and you brought that and you received the Torah and you gave the Torah. Look what you've done. Yes, you're not going to finish this dream of yours. You're not going to achieve this vision. That doesn't mean you've done nothing. And that's a very important lesson in life that when we don't get to complete what we thought of, what we hoped, what we dreamed we want, we one day we would be able to complete, that doesn't mean we did nothing. We did a lot. We achieved a lot. And we have to look back and we have to appreciate and reflect upon how far we've come and how much we've achieved and how much we've accomplished. Okay, the next thing. So God says, I want you to listen to all the mitzvos, all the mitzvos in the, in the Torah, follow them so that you will possess the land. It's a very interesting clause there, meaning that he is putting the possession of the land conditional upon the fulfillment of the mitzvos, meaning that our presence, our existence, our ability to live, dwell, flourish, build, and express ourselves in the land depends directly on our fulfillment of the mitzvahs of Hashem's Torah. And when we fail to live up to those, to our responsibility and this covenant, and we fail to perform and, and abide by and, and, and commit to the mitzvahs of Hashem, then we will not possess the land which is why we lost the land. Even after we entered in the land, we lost it. And then we regained it. And then we lost it. And now we well, thank God we've regained it. But we have to remember this because God forbid, we don't want to lose the land again. And Hashem makes the existence, our presence, our ability to thrive and flourish in the land of Israel, conditional upon our fulfillment of Hashem's mitzvot in the Torah, right here in this, these passages. Okay. Um, and then it says something very interesting over here. It says, I want you to keep all the mitzvot. And in, in chapter four, verse number two, you shall not add to the word that I commanded you, nor shall you subtract from it to observe the commandments of Hashem, your God, that I command you. 
right? So God says two things. Don't add to the mitzvos. Do not subtract. I'm giving you 613 mitzvos. Don't add, don't subtract. Now, I fully understand don't subtract. I get it. God said I'm giving you 613 commandments. Don't eliminate any of them. Don't cross them off. And I would just pause here for a second and say that this, you know, it says right here in the Torah, do not take away any of these mitzvahs, which is a very glaring question that has to be answered by certain movements within Judaism that have done just that, right? There are groups of, uh, of, of, and movements within Judaism in the last few hundred years that have taken away the mitzvahs in the Torah, that have eliminated mitzvahs in the Torah, that have removed mitzvahs in the Torah. That it says explicitly here, do not take out the mitzvahs. Sometimes they're gonna be inconvenient. Sometimes they're gonna challenge your modern sensitivities and your, what you're comfortable with. Sometimes they're gonna be really, really hard to do. And you know what? That's okay. Struggle with them, grapple with them, grow with them. No one says you have to fulfill every mitzvah in the Torah every minute, but just don't eliminate them. Don't take out your white out and erase and eliminate mitzvahs in the Torah just because they're a little inconvenient or they're very difficult or they, they don't resonate with me or they offend me or they somehow are incompatible with my modern sensitivities. Don't take out your white out and cross them out. What should you do? You should grapple with them, struggle with them, grow with them. Okay, so I get that. That makes sense. Don't subtract. But what's wrong with adding mitzvahs to the Torah? What's wrong with adding mitzvahs to the Torah? It seems like a good idea, right? It seems like a way that I could show my commitment, my religious fervor and energy for Hashem's commandments. God said, dwell in a sukkah for seven days. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to stay in that sukkah for eight days. Oh, God said, put four species together and shake them around. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to take my lulav and my esrog and my hadassin and my arabas, and I'm also going to take a, uh, um, an apple tree branch or whatever I like. I'm going to take you know, from some flowers from my garden. I'm going to add a species. God said, take four species and shake them. I'm going to take five. And by doing so, I'll show my commitment, my religious fervor, my energy for God's mitzvahs. What's wrong with that? Why is that so bad? That's question number one. Question number two is, didn't the rabbis do just this? Didn't they add on to the Torah when they created all of their rabbinical fences? You know, in Torah law, we, in Judaism, we have two types of law. We have Torah law and we have rabbinical law. God gave us the Torah, 613 commandments. And then the rabbis added a whole bunch of additional laws, stringencies. I'll give you an example. The Torah says, do not light a fire on Shabbos. Can I, light, can I carry matches on, around on Shabbos? Can I move a candle around on Shabbos? As far as the Torah is concerned, yes, that's not a problem. But the rabbis come along and they add and they say, you know what? Don't even touch candle on Shabbos. Don't move matches on Shabbos because you might come to light a fire. Okay, so those are rabbinical ordinances. So isn't that called adding on to the Torah? So we have two questions. One, what's wrong with adding on to the Torah? I understand what's wrong with subtracting, but what's wrong with adding on? And two, didn't the rabbis just do just that? I'd like to answer those two questions. Question, the first question I'd like to answer by using, sharing with you a mushal, a parable that was given by the Dubna Magi. The Dubna Magi lived in, in Dubna, Lithuania, and he was one of the great Maginim. He used to travel around from city to city, and he used to share um, his, his ethical and moral teaching, and he always, always did so in the form of parable. In Hebrew, we call it a mushal. In fact, there's a story that said, they say that somebody once asked the Dubna Magin, Rabbi, you have so many things to teach us. Why do you always put your, your teachings, your wisdom in the form of a parable? He said, that's a very good question. I'm going to answer with a parable. And he said, there was once a very, very, very beautiful man. 
He was exquisitely handsome, but he didn't have any clothes. And he went around, everywhere he went, he went naked. And no one could look at him. It was like, you couldn't look at this guy because it was too, it was too humiliating. It was too overwhelming. So what did they do? They made him a nice suit. They put some clothing on him. And then everyone could gaze upon him and, and recognize and appreciate his beauty. So he said, truth, pure truth, wisdom, that's not clothed in the language of a parable is sometimes too uncomfortable. It's too overwhelming. People can't really deal with and grapple with truth that way. So what do we need to do? We need to put some clothing on it. We need to put a suit on it. We need to dress it up a little bit. So what do we do? We put it in the form of a parable. And when you teach it in the form of a parable, then the kernel of truth, the wisdom can be absorbed and digested. So anyway, they asked the dude Nomagi this question. Why is it? that adding on to the Torah is a problem. So he said, I'm going to tell you a Moshe. I'm going to tell you a parable. He said, there was once a man who went to his friend and he asked his friend, can I borrow a spoon? I don't have a spoon. Can I borrow a spoon? And his friend said, sure, no problem. Here, take a spoon. He says, thank you. He comes back the next day to return the spoon and he gives him two spoons. And the guy says, why are you giving me two spoons? I only gave you one spoon. He said, I know it's weird, but your spoon... I used it and then it's kind of strange, but your spoon gave birth. Your spoon gave birth to another spoon. So I'm returning your spoon and the new spoon that it gave birth to. Next day, he goes over to his friend's house and he says, can I borrow a hammer? His friend says, sure, no problem. Gives him a hammer. Comes back the next day, he returns two hammers. What are you doing? I gave you one hammer. I know, I know, but same thing. Your hammer gave birth in my house, so I'm giving you back two hammers. The third day he comes to his friend and he says, can I borrow your silver candlesticks? Your silver candlestick, one. And the neighbor says, yeah, sure. You know, he's thinking this guy, the candlestick's gonna give birth and, and he's gonna get two back. So he comes back the next day and he says, I'm sorry, I have some bad news for you. So what is it? He says, you know your candlestick that you lent me? Yeah, you know, it was in my house and yeah, well, it died. So what do you mean it died? Candlesticks don't die. They're not alive. He said, you had no problem believing that a spoon gave birth or that a hammer gave birth. So why, did, why can you not believe that a candlestick died? That was the mushal. That was the parable. And here's how he explains it. He said, once the Torah becomes pliable, once it can give birth, so to speak, once you look at the Torah as something that can give birth, something that you can add to, something that you can play around with, something that you can edit, something that you can change. Well, then if I can edit it and change it and add on to it, well, then I can also edit it and change it and remove from it. So the reason why the Torah says don't add on to the Torah is because as the Talmud says, kol hamosif gorea, anyone who adds on will eventually come to subtract. And we don't, Hashem does not want anyone removing mitzvahs and commandments from this Torah. So that answers the first question. But what about the second question, the rabbis? Don't the rabbis do this all the time? Isn't this what the rabbis are in the business of doing? Adding on mitzvahs to the Torah? So the answer is no, that's not what they do. The rabbis never claim it. The rabbis are told in the Torah to add safeguards, to create safeguards to the Torah law. What they're not allowed to do is create laws and say this is a Torah law. Right? What they do is they create a law and they say, the Torah said, don't light a fire on Shabbos. We rabbis, human beings, flesh and blood, are adding on, superimposing a rabbinical stringency upon that that says, don't even touch the candle. Don't even move the matches. They're not saying the Torah says, don't touch candles. You can't do that. That's not what the Torah says. The Torah says, don't light a fire. So the rabbis can add on rabbinical stringencies, as long as they're clear that they're not making up a new Torah law, they're only adding a fence around existing Torah law. Mike, Michael. So if it's not a Torah law, does achieving it not really count as achieving a mitzvah, but it helps you, but it helps you achieve another mitzvah that actually is a Torah law? Is that the difference? So that's a great question. And, and it requires a little bit more information. And that is that there are two types of rabbinical laws. Just like there are two types of Torah laws, positive commandments, 
right? You shall sit in a sukkah, you shall eat matzah and prohibitions. Um, you shall not eat this, you shall not wear this, right? So, so too the rabbinical laws come in two forms. They come in the, in the positive form, which are positive commandments to do something that the rabbis created. For example, reading the Megillus Esther, the book of Esther on Purim is a rabbinical commandment, not from the Torah. It's a commandment to do something, read the Megillah. There's a command, rabbinical commandment to light Hanukkah candles. That's not a Torah commandment. There was no Hanukkah in the Torah. That's a rabbinical commandment to light the Hanukkah candles. Those are rabbinical, positive rabbinical commandments. So when you do those, you are doing a mitzvah for sure. You're absolutely doing a mitzvah. It's not a Torah mitzvah. It's a rabbinical mitzvah. It may be one drop less um, meaningful but you should know also that the Torah tells the rabbis to make this type of legislation. So when you fulfill a Torah, a rabbi, a rabbinical commandment, you're also filling the Torah commandment, which is listen to the rabbinical legislation. Yeah. Okay, good. Let's move uh, on. Rab rabbi, you can defer the question, but uh, it seems like the hole in this thing is the uh, neder, which you talked about a couple weeks ago, which mm -hmm. takes on the halachic status of a commandment. Yeah, it takes on the halakhic status of a prohibition. Um, and it's really, it's, it is an exception to this rule, really. And were, had, had the, did the Torah not specifically spell out your, um, the ability to take on a vow and to, and, and to forbid something upon yourself, um, then you wouldn't be allowed to do it. You know, and it's a, and it's a, good, it's a very good question, but it's, the one, it's really one, and that and the Nazarite, those are really exceptions to the law because normally you're not allowed to add on, but in this particular area, you're, you're not adding on a Torah law. What you're doing is it's subtle difference. You're adding on a personal um, obligation that you're placing upon yourself not to eat this or not to partake in this. And that becomes, um, because there's a Torah law that says when you do that, when you go through that process and make that vow, that now becomes prohibited for you to eat it. It's the Torah that prohibits you from eating it. What you've done is you, you have added that upon yourself and then the Torah kicks in and prohibits it. So it's a little, it's a, it's a nuanced thing, but it's, it's not really adding on a mitzvah in the Torah. There is a mitzvah in the Torah that says, if you take a vow not to do X, then the Torah says you can't do X. Okay. Um, Next thing I want to tell you is a very beautiful verse in the Torah where, uh, and we say this, um, we say this regularly, we say this multiple times a week in davening. It says, Vatem ba'ashem alokechem, chaim kulchem hayom, which means literally, you shall cling to Hashem, your God, all of you who are alive today. And the word here for cling is devakim. And um, this is the idea, there's a Hebrew word, there's a concept in, in Judaism called devekus, devekut. Devekut means clinging to Hashem. And it's funny, in Hebrew, modern Hebrew, the word for glue is devek. It means to, to, to adhere two things together. So we are encouraged, we are, we are commanded to have devekus with Hashem, to cling to Hashem, to adhere ourselves to Hashem. And this is something that the philosophers, both Jewish and non-Jewish, have debated whether it's possible to have devakus with an infinite creation, an infinite, an infinite creator. We are not infinite creation, an infinite creator. We are finite creations. How is it possible for a finite creation to cling to, to have a devakus, to have an intimate connection with an infinite, an infinite creator? Um, how do we go about doing it? And I'll just share with you one little insight from the Bala Turin. The Bala Turin points out over here that in the, when you look at a Torah scroll at this sentence and you look at the word devakim, which means clean, you shall clean, you shall cleave to Hashem. Um, the, the letter kuf has a little crown on top of it, which is unusual, a little crown. And what's the significance to that crown? So the Bala Turin tells us this is the secret of how to cling to Hashem. The secret to how to cling to Hashem is in the, in the letter Kuf. In the letter Kuf. What's the secret? 
What does, what is the gematria? This is today's uh, advanced question for today. What is the gematria, the numerical value of the letter kuf? Anyone? Anyone? Okay, I'll tell you. 100. 100. Kuf in gematria, the letter kuf, you know, that, that kuf letter equals 100 in gematria. And the Talmud says that um, King David instituted a practice that we should say kuf brachos choyom, 100 blessings a day. 100 blessings a day. That means that throughout our day, whether I'm having a sip of my tea or I am using the bathroom or I am saying the Amidah or I am benching after eating a meal, I should be that, 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 that King David encourages everybody to say, Kuf brachas b'choyo, mea brachas, 100 brachas every day, 100 blessings. And the idea is that what is a blessing? A blessing is just a little touch of contact. It's a little touch point between me and Hashem. It's sprinkled throughout our day, a hundred times throughout the day. Thank you, Hashem, for this tea, for creating everything. Thank you, Hashem, for um, allowing my, my body to function properly when I use the bathroom. Thank you, Hashem, for the, the, the bread and the sustenance that you gave me. So if I do this throughout the day, consistently and constantly throughout the day, little moments, little, nothing huge, no, you know, massive grand spiritual moments. It's not a, uh, I'm not having a prophecy. I'm not witnessing a miracle. I'm just thank, thanking Hashem, little, little moments of gratitude throughout my day. That kuf is the secret of how I create tevekus. The way I create tevekus is with little, little hits, constant, small moments of gratitude. And I'll tell you a little secret um, for those of you who are married or thinking about getting married or would like to be married or would like to be married to someone else. No, I'm just kidding. Um, they, uh, it says in the Torah also that in the Torah, it says, a person should leave his mother and his father and he should cleave, same word, devakus, to his wife. So the same word that's used to describe how we are meant to cling to our creator. That very same word is there describing how we are meant to cling to or cleave to our spouse. And therefore, the secret to how to do it is exactly the same. Not about the, um, <laughs> it's not about the, um, it's not about the huge things. It's not about the great vacations that you go on or the, Sorry, Bob, but the diamond rings that you buy her or, I mean, those are important. Don't get me wrong. And if you do, make sure you go to Bob. But that's not what it's about. It's not about those big things. It's about the little moments of, hey, I appreciate what you did for me today. Hey, have a great day, honey. A text, a call, or whatever it is. The little, little things. In Hebrew, in Yiddish, it's called plenikite. The little things. The plenikite. Those little moments, those little touches, um, that's how you create devakus in a relationship with a spouse, and that's how you create the vacus in a relationship with Hashem. Okay, we got to move on. There's a lot to cover over here. Chapter 4, verses 5 through 8. I want to read these verses. Listen to this. So powerful. Every time I read this, I'm just like, oh, wow. So God says, Moshe says, see, I have taught you decrees and ordinances as Hashem, my God, has commanded me to do so, in the midst of the land to which you have come to possess it. I have given you all these decrees and ordinances. You shall safeguard and perform them, the commandments. Safeguard and perform the mitzvot. Okay? For it is your wisdom and your discernment in the eyes of the peoples who shall hear all these decrees and who shall say, surely a wise and discerning people is this great nation, and which, and which is a great uh, for which is a great nation that God that a, sorry for which is a great nation that has a God who is close to it as is Hashem our God whenever we call to Him, and which is a great nation 
that has righteous decrees and ordinances, such as this entire Torah that I place before you this day. What Moshe is saying here is such a powerful lesson. Guys, you think Jewish people, he's speaking to the Jewish people then, and he's speaking to us and every Jew that ever lived. Moshe is saying, guys, listen, you might be tempted when you're living among the nations of the world and you're surrounded by Gentiles, you might want to, you know, hide your Judaism a little bit. Don't make such a big deal about it. Play it down. Don't be open about it. You know, be a, a, a Jew in your home and a German on the street. That was the motto of the reform movement in Germany 150 years ago. Be a Jew in your home and be a German on the street. Meaning when you're at home, you do Shabbos, you do kosher. But when you're on the street, when you're in public, don't go around as a Jew. Don't, don't broadcast your Judaism. Don't publicize the fact that you do. Don't do your mitzvot openly and publicly. And the Torah is telling us just the opposite. Be proud to live as a Jew. The world respects us when we live the way that we are told to live But in the Torah. They, the world wants us to live this way. What do they say when they see us living by the Torah? They say, they say, um, they say surely a wise and discerning people is this great nation. When they see us living up to, adhering to it, and committing to the Torah, right? This is why it's so, so important to remember these words. The greatest, you know, in recent Jewish history, the greatest period of assimilation began when? In Germany, in the 1850s, in the 18, mid 18, early 1800s. That's when anti-Semitism began to become so bad because when the Jewish people hide their Judaism, when we pretend on the street that we're not Jewish, that's when intuitively, instinctually, anti-Semites rise up from the, from the shadows. Because that's what anti-Semitism is. It's built into the system by Hashem, who doesn't want us to stray away and to assimilate and to disappear. So as long as we're living our lives committed Jews, proud Jews, living according to the Torah and the commandments, then the nations of the world say, wow, what a wise people, what an amazing people, what an amazing Torah filled with wisdom. But when we try as a people to hide it and conceal it, well, Hashem doesn't let that happen. And that's when anti-Semitism rears its ugly head. And that's right, right here in the Torah, incredible lesson. Um, I want to just reread um, You know what? Maybe we'll skip that because we're running. We're not going to have enough time for everything. Okay, so we'll, we'll move on a little bit. Um, moving on to a, a little bit further, there's a very, very powerful verse. Just a few verses later, in chapter four, verse nine, it says, "Only beware for yourself, and greatly beware for your soul. Beware for your soul, lest you forget the things that your eyes have beheld." unless you remove them from your heart all the days of your life and make them known to your children and your children's children the day you stood before Hashem, your God, at Horeb. When Hashem said to me, gather the people to me and I shall let them hear my words so that they shall learn to fear me all the days of your life on earth. And then I just want to just add to that that a little bit further on, there's a similar line that says, um, face to face, this is in chapter five, verse four, face to face did Hashem speak to you on the mountain from amid the fire, okay? So there's two times in this Parsha where the Torah goes out of its way to explicitly say and claim that when God spoke to the Jewish people and revealed to them the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai, that it was done in front of all the Jewish people, in front of everybody. You, it says, um, your eyes have beheld this, right? That's your eyes have seen this. You saw it. You stood there at the foot of the mountain and you saw with your own eyes. Face to face, Hashem spoke to you on the mountain. And this is what we call, and we've mentioned this many times, but it's very important to know where this is in the Torah and to see how it, uh, where, where it comes out of, that this is the idea of what we call a national revelation. And this, as I've said many times before, but you can never review this enough times, this 
is the single factor that distinguishes Judaism from every other religion on the face of the earth. And that is that Judaism and only Judaism claims that when God revealed himself to people, to human beings, it was done so to the entire nation, not to one individual like Christianity says, or Islam says, or Mormonism says, or any other religion that has ever existed says that God revealed himself to one person. The Jewish claim is that God revealed himself to the entire Jewish people at Mount Sinai, which is huge because if you're making up a religion, if you're a fake, you're a phony, a charlatan, and you're making up a religion, you can't claim that. You can't gather together 2 million people and tell them, hey, you guys all saw God revealing himself in front of all of you and appointing me as his prophet. If you're Moshe and you're trying to make this up, you can't gather together the two and a half million people and say, wasn't that awesome last night when we all stood at the mountain and you saw God reveal himself to you and make me his prophet? You can't do that. You can't make that up. You can't tell two and a half million people they saw something they didn't see, right? But if you're making up a religion, you have to tell one person, you know, and then tell that, you have to say, hey, God told me. God told me personally, and I'm coming to tell you that last night God came to me and told me I'm his prophet. Okay? But if you're God and you're not a fake, you're not a phony making up a religion, but you're God and you're trying to con connect yourself to a group of people, what are you going to do? You're going to gather all of them together and you're going to reveal yourself to all of them and not tell one person, hey, I'm God, go tell everybody about me. Judaism is the only religion that makes this claim. Now, it's amazing because Christianity and Islam both agree and confer that God revealed himself to the entire Jewish people at Mount Sinai. They agree with the revelation at Sinai that took place in front of all the Jewish people. And then they say, yeah, and then later God came to me. It's amazing. Came to me just personally, little old Paul or little old Muhammad and came to me and told me, good news, I've changed my mind, I'm no longer with the Jewish people, you're now my guy, go tell everybody. Why does Paul do that? Why does Muhammad do that? Why don't they go and make the same claim? Why don't they make the exact same claim? National revelation, God came and revealed himself to me and to the entire Jewish people. Why doesn't God make that claim? Come say hi, you can say hi. Why doesn't God make that claim to everybody? Hi. Um, and the answer is because you can't make that up if it didn't happen. And that's why the Torah is the only document and Judaism is the only religion that makes that claim. And furthermore, if you look a little bit further in chapter 4, verses 33, 32 through 35, Moshe even goes a step further and he says that no other religion is ever going to duplicate this claim. He says, for inquire now regarding the early days that came before you, from the days when Hashem created man on earth, and from one end of the earth to the other end of heaven. Has there ever been anything like this great thing, or has anything like it ever been heard? In other words, what Moshe is saying is that there is no other claim like this that will ever be made. How can Moshe say that? 3,300 years ago, how can Moshe say no other religion is ever going to make this claim. And guess what? No other religion makes this claim when they certainly would have liked to have been able to make the claim, but they don't. How does Moshe know that? Simple, because you can't make up a claim like that if it didn't happen. You can't tell 3 million people they witnessed something if they didn't see it. So the only way you can make that claim is if it actually happened. So that's a really fundamental belief in Judaism, and it comes from this week's Parsha, this idea of a national revelation that distinguishes us from all other religions. Okay, um, it says over here in um, verse, chapter 4, verse 25, on page 963 in the Stone Chumash, it says, um, I'm going to read a few verses over here, when you beget children, okay, you'll have, you will have, you will have generations and grandchildren, 
and you will venoshantem ba'aret, and you will be you'll become old in the land, meaning you'll be in the land for a long time. It'll be old, L literally. You'll become old in the land. You will grow corrupt and make carved images of anything, and you will do evil in the eyes of God, Hashem your God, and you will anger him. I point heaven and earth to this day to bear witness against you that you will surely perish quickly from the land to which you are crossing the Jordan River to possess. Like I said before, that your existence on the land, your ability to thrive and flourish and build and grow in the land is totally completely conditional upon your commitment to the Torah and the mitzvot. And if you grow old in the land and you start to uh, build graven um, images, then I will expel you from the land. You shall surely not have lengthy days upon it for you will be destroyed. Hashem will scatter you among the peoples and you will be left few in number among the nations where Hashem will lead you. This is, of course, um, pr prophecy over here that the Jewish people would be sent into exile, as we know we were. There you will serve God, the handiwork of man of wood and stone. And then it says, from there you will seek God and your God, uh, Hashem, your God, and, he will, and you will find him if you search for him with all your heart, with all your soul. And you, when you're in distress and all these things will befall you at the end of days, you will return to Hashem, your God, and hearken to his voice. And then Hashem will return you from the land and uh, bring you back to the land that was promised to your forefathers. Okay, there's a lot just in this to unpack. First of all, um, it's just interesting how this all starts. How does this all start? When the shantan bars, when you'll get, things will get old for you in the land. And I was thinking about this, you know, I've been like thinking about this. I can't wait. I can't wait to be stuck in my first traffic jam in Jerusalem. And I can't wait to be standing in my first long line in Jerusalem. And by the way, those things will probably both happen the first day I'm there, right? And I can't wait. Why? Because I'm going to say to myself, oh, do you know what my grandparents, my great-grandparents, my great-great-grandparents for the last 2,000 years would give to be standing in a line at the post office in Jerusalem or stuck in a traffic jam in Yerushalayim? Do you know what that means to be stuck in a traffic jam? That means that there are so many Jews here in the land, something that didn't exist for 2,000 years. I can't wait for that moment, okay? But you know what I'm afraid of? I'm afraid of the second time it happens, or the third time, or the fourth time, or whatever time it's going to be, when I'm going to say, oh, traffic. I can't stand this traffic in Jerusalem. Or I'm going to be waiting for the 15th time in a line at the post office. I'm going to say, this is ridiculous. I've never waited in lines. I can't stand this. And the post office, you know, that's what I'm afraid of. Because the minute that I, that I lose that excitement, that awareness, that feeling, that every time he talks about the, the land of Israel in the Torah, it says, I need no saying, Lachem Esar. It says, I am giving you this land in the present tense. Because when you live in the land of Israel, you have to recognize and appreciate every moment that it's a gift and that it can be taken away at any moment. What happens when the Shantan Bharats, we get old in the land, it gets old. Okay, yeah, we're here, fine, we're here. Okay, I got it. Return of the exiles. Yeah, but like this traffic is ridiculous. This line at the post office is annoying. So we have to be very, very careful not to ever feel that way or to take for granted what it means to have Eretz Israel. I think that, um, that Goldberg pointed this out, and it's so true. I think a lot of us are feeling this. You know, most of our lives, for sure, in my life, in my lifetime, there's never been a time where, okay, maybe you have to, you know, spend a lot of money on a plane ticket, but there's never been a time where you can't get on a plane and go to Israel. Right now, you know, I mean, people on this call have tried to go to Israel, visit family even, or even just to take their family to Israel, and they've been denied. You can't go. So, you know, this whole pandemic, one of the things that it's done is it's given us hopefully an appreciation, you know, a longing and appreciation to be able to go to the land. We look forward to the time when we'll be able to go there again. Right now we're like in exile again. So anyway, that's, that's where it all starts. And then um, it talks about um, this. Uh, so I was thinking about this idea, like, and then you return to the land. And then after, after the exile, you know, after the exile is prophesied, we'll return to the land. 
And it's also just important to remember that when we go to the land, when we go to Israel today, we're not just you know going on a vacation or going on tours. We're literally fulfilling prophecy because the Torah right here in this very spot tells us you will be you will return upon your, into Hashem, meaning there'll be a movement of tshuva. The Jewish people will hearken to to uh, Hashem's commandments, and we will return. And when you go to Israel, you have to know that you're literally the living fulfillment of a prophecy. Okay. Way, 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 way behind over here. Um, let's see. Um, then there's another verse over here, which is so famous. Um, we say it every day, twice a day in the lane of the Yedata Hayom. This is in chapter 4, verse 39. <speaking in Hebrew> Literally, 30, verse 39, you shall know this day and take it and return it to your heart that Hashem is the God in the heaven and above and in the heaven above and on the earth below. There is none other, none other than Hashem ain owed. But there's an important thing that I want to just point out over here. And that is that there are, seem to be two steps. It says, Viyadata Hayom, you shall know this. Know what? That there's Hashem, Elohim, is the God, the one and only God. There's no other God. You shall know it. And you shall return it to your heart. You shall bring it into your heart. There's two steps. The Rambam, Maimonides, talks about this. The first step in knowing Hashem, in knowing that there's nothing other than Hashem, that there's only Hashem in this world, that there's nothing else, there's two steps. Step one is you shall know this intellectually. You have to know it. You have to go to a discovery program. Or you have to do the research online and you have to study and you have to learn and you have to understand and you have to see proofs of God in, in philosophy and proofs of God in nature and proofs of God and proofs of Torah and all these things intellectually. Gadu, you data hayom. You need to know these things intellectually, but it cannot, God forbid, stop there. There can't be a disconnect between the brain and the heart. That's the hard part. It's easy to know things. It's a lot harder to internalize. The greatest distance in the world is the distance between the mind and the heart. There's things that I know. I know I should be a nicer husband. I know I should be a more in control father. I know I should be a more committed son. Everything. I know these things. I know I should work out every day. I know things. I know I should eat better. But there's knowing in your brain and knowing in your heart. Until you know something in your heart, you're not going to do it. My, my teacher in Israel used to say that if you want to um, convince somebody to stop smoking, you know, you can take them, sit them down, and give them a 200-page Surgeon General report with all the data and all the information and tell them to read it from cover to cover. And they can read it. And guess what they're not going to do? They're not going to stop smoking because that's just information. That's knowledge in the brain. Be a if you, want to quit, if you want them to quit smoking, put them in the car, bring them to the hospital, and take them to see the people that are, God forbid, you know, have lung cancer or have had tracheotomies from smoking. So then they're going to quit smoking because that's vidata hayom, that's internalization of information. You don't act, you don't grow, you don't change until you've internalized the knowledge. So if we want to know that there's God, a know that there's nothing other than God, it starts with Vidat Hayom, has to start with the intellect, but then ultimately it has to be Vashevosa Lababecha. You've got to internalize it and you've got to bring it into your emotional realm as well. And now for a generalization, which is um, true, but it's a generalization. And that is that women generally have less of a problem with this. The Talmud says that women have bina yaseira. They have extra bina, which means that they have a greater ability to internalize information, knowledge more quickly and more, more, more deeply. It's more of a natural thing for women. Women are less likely, not doesn't mean always, it doesn't mean never, but they're less likely to um, retain, to keep information solely in the realm of the cerebral without internalizing it and making it a part of their emotional reality as well, because they've been a Yusera. So it's men who struggle with this, men who have a difficulty with this, which is why, I'm sure you see this, saw this one coming, which is why men 
are commanded to wear tefillin, women are not. Because what is tefillin? Tefillin is a symbolic reminder every single day. I put the box on my head that has the Shema in it, that says there's one God, there's nothing other than God, and I have to love God, and I have to fear God, and everything that's in the Shema, I put it on my head. And then what happens, I take two straps, and those straps come down over my heart. And they're like highways, informational highways to take that information and bring it down, internalize what's in that box, what's in my head, into my heart. And then I've got another box on my arm that picks up the signal from my heart and wraps around my arms all the way to my hand, which symbolizes the realm of action, which symbolizes the realm of doing. And that's the symbolism of tefillin. Get this clear, get it straight intellectually, but don't let it stop there. Then it's got to go into my heart and then it's got to ultimately translate into my actions. And we don't allow it to remain just in the realm of the intellect. So that's a, why men need to fill in every day so they can take that message of aim, oh, there's nothing other than Hashem and use the tool of tefillin to help internalize that message into the heart, into the realm of action. Um, okay. He's not putting up um, visuals, so I've got to follow him. Uh, to not, no, it's okay, but it's, I'm having trouble hearing him too. I'm wondering. Okay. Um, Okay, I want to just point out one more thing over here. Um, I've got two or two more quick things. Um, one is from the um, Rabbi Yosef Chaim from Baghdad, who is known as the Ben Yehoyada. Ben Yehoyada, one of the great um, Sephardic Kabbalists. And he says over here a really interesting thing. This Pasuk, let's read this verse again. The verse said, you shall know this day and take to your heart that Hashem, that Hashem, he is your God in the heaven above and on the earth below. What does that little phrase mean? Um, uh, let me see it in Hebrew. Um, in the heavens, mima'al, above, the Aretz, and on the earth, Mitachas, below. I know the heavens are above and the earth is below. What's this adding? So he says a very important lesson in life. He says, when it comes to matters of Shemayim, spiritual matters, areas of spiritual achievement, spiritual acquisition, gaining Torah knowledge, doing mitzvos, doing chesed, all matters of Shemayim. What's the trick? How am I supposed to grow and how am I supposed to relate to matters of Shemayim, heavenly matters? The answer to that is Mima'al, look above you, meaning look to people who are above you in those areas. Look to a mentor who is a bigger Torah scholar than you are, a better davener, a more committed davener than you are, a bigger Baal Chesed, a bigger person, a doer of Chesed than you are. Whatever it is that you're trying to work on, in your spiritual life, in your heavenly life, find somebody who's got who's achieved more than you. Look up, look up to somebody, find a mentor, somebody who's achieved more than you, and that's how you will be able to um, develop yourself spiritually. But what about when it comes to the material? When it comes to matters of arts, when it, when when it comes to um, earthly matters. So what should you do? You should look. Mitachas, you should look down. What does it mean, look down? It means find somebody who has less than you. Find people who are, who, are, who are less blessed, who are less fortunate than you are. They may not have the blessings that you have in your life and realize and appreciate how fortunate you are, how grateful you are for all the blessings that you do when you look and you realize that there's so many people who don't have these blessings that I have in my life, who don't have these things that are, that are, they might not have the same financial security that I have. They may not have the same family situation that I have. They may not have whatever blessings that it is. They might find, think about the fact that there are so many people that are so much less fortunate than we are 
And that's a key to life. When it comes to spiritual matters, look up, find mentors, find people that you can model your behavior. Like I want to dive in like that guy. I want to learn Torah like that guy. When it comes to material acquisitions, focus on the fact that there are so many people who are so far less fortunate than we are and it'll, it'll allow you to uh, be happy in life. Okay. And, um, okay, I just want to say one last thing over here. And it's ridiculous, but this, this should be an hour in itself. But um, the Ten Commandments, the Decalogue, are come up again in this Parsha. We know that the Ten Commandments are, 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 are brought twice in the Torah, once in Parsha Yisro, in, Ex, in the book of Exodus, and a second time here in the Eschanan, in Deuteronomy, when Moshe is retelling the story. And obviously, if Moshe is retelling and highlighting the story, of course, he's going to touch on the, uh, the Ten Commandments, and he's going to tell the, repeat the Ten Commandments. So he repeats the Ten Commandments over here. But when he does, there are little nuances, little differences. And there are, if you want to do an interesting, fascinating study, just Google, make sure you're looking at a good source, whether it's Aish or Chabad or Sameach or Virtual Based Medrash or YU Torah, some good legitimate source and read or listen to a cheer on the topic of the differences, the nuances between the first giving of the Ten Commandments and the second giving of the Ten Commandments. Fascinating, fascinating how the commentaries um, focus on this. But I'm just going to tell you one, two, two, two quick things. One is that in, in Exodus, it says, when it talks about Shabbos, it says, um, Zachor, Zachor as HaShabbos, as Yom HaShabbos. Remember, remember the, the Shabbos. Um, let me just read it to you. Um, remember the Sabbath and sanctify it. And you see, when you get to the Ten Commandments over here in our Parsha, in Parsha's Veschanan, it doesn't say remember the Shabbos. It says what? It says Shamor es Yom HaShabbos Lekadosho. Safeguard the Sabbath and sanctify it. Okay, so what's the difference between Zahor, remember, and Shamor, guard? So the answer is that there are two types of commandments on Shabbos. There are positive commandments. Those are the things like make Kiddush, Davin, do the Shabbos Davin, the Shabbos prayers, Oneg Shabbos, Herring, Cholent, Kishki, Chaims, right? There's the there's the positive elements of Shabbos, Havdalah at the end, Kiddush and Havdalah in the beginning and the end. Those are the, those are the um, Zahor, remember Shabbos. Shamor, safeguard Shabbos, is referring to the prohibitions. Safeguard the prohibitions, the 39 categories of work. Don't drive on Shabbos, don't light a fire on Shabbos, don't use technology on Shabbos. So the Torah mentions it twice because the Torah wants you to know that both of these components together make up Shabbos. Okay? There's Shamor Vezachor. There's remembering Shabbos, making Kiddush, davening, making Abdullah, eating herring. Okay? That's, that is um, remembering the Shabbos, marking it in as holy and different, and wearing special clothing on Shabbos. And then there's Shamor, safeguarded. Don't do Malacha. Don't do the 39 categories of prohibited work. Together, that's Shabbos. Now, I just want to say it, you know, um, they're both awesome, but ultimately you need to be working towards both. So people always ask me this question, are the people at Chaim Center Shomer Shabbos? So I, I usually say to them, you know, most of them are not Shomer Shabbos, but they're almost all and I coined this phrase and I really like it. They're almost all Zohar Shabbos. What does it mean, Zohar Shabbos? They, 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 may, they may not be Shomer Shabbos. They might not be safeguarding the Shabbos, meaning they might not be careful with the prohibitions of not driving and technology and lights, etc. But they're Zohar Shabbos. They're very, they remember Shabbos. They make Kiddush, they daven, they, they make Havdalah, they eat herring, they have Shabbos meals. And that's a beautiful thing. Our community, 
has is Zocher Shabbos. That's a huge thing, especially when you look how far you've come. Remember, Moshe was told to look to the east also. You have to look how far you've come. You know, five years, 10 years, 20 years ago, our community, most of the people in our community weren't making Abdullah and davening and making Kiddush and eating herring and keeping doing Shabbos dick, you know, like that. So it's a huge thing. It's a wonderful thing. But it's also important to remember that to really get there, the finish line, to move forward, we also have to be working towards being Shomer Shabbos, which means being careful with the prohibitions of Shabbos as well. The prohibitions of letting a fire, of driving, of turning on lights, of using technology, et cetera, et cetera. So that's just something to keep in mind that there are two aspects of Shabbos and they show up in the two different representations of the Ten Commandments, Shamor and Zohar. Um, all right, it's nine o'clock. I think we should probably, you know what? I'll finish with last one last board. They say, from, I, I remember this board from the Baal Shem Tov, but I tried to find it. I couldn't find it. But in the last of the Ten Commandments, it talks about coveting. The last of the Ten Commandments talks about coveting. And it says, which means, uh, which means, um, you shall not covet your fellow's wife. You shall not desire your fellow's house, his field, his slave, his maidservant, his ox, his donkey, or any, or, and, and everything that belongs to him. What are those last words adding? What's the point of saying that's And everything that belongs to him. So they say this is the answer to how to succeed in that covenant. You know, the reason why we covet is because we look at our friend and we say, oh, wow, he's got a nicer car than I. Or you say, oh, wow, look at my friend. He's got a nicer house than I have. Or he's got a, this, or he's got that. And if you isolate and you look at individual things that he has that I don't have or that she has that I don't have, then you're going to covet. You know how you don't covet? When you look at the whole Asher Lerecha, look at the whole picture. You don't know what kind of tsaris they have. You don't know what's going on in their home. You don't know what their shalom bias looks like. You don't know the struggles that they have with their kids. You don't know the mental health issues that might exist. You don't know the pain and suffering that they might be going through. You don't know the difficulties that are going on in their relationships. You don't know. The way not to covet is to remember, don't just isolate one thing. Every human being is a package. Do you really want to be in his shoes? Do you really want... Because you can't, you know, you can't just pick and choose. I'll take his car. I'll take his wife. I'll take his house. I'll take his job. No, it's the whole shalirecha. Look at the whole person and understand that as difficult as it might be and as many difficulties as we may have and things that we might not have that we want, when we take the whole picture, we're going to be very, very reluctant to um, want to be that person in its entirety. So remember that. And that's the key to not covering. Okay, it's a lot. We covered a lot. Um, and there's so much more. But uh, anyway, it's just a reminder. Next week, class switches to Sunday mornings at 930. I know that doesn't work for everybody. But um, there, there, of course, there will be a recording of the class. And it will be sent out. So if you miss it, you'll be able to see it that way. And um, next week, next Sunday, 930, Rabbi Gadi will be teaching. But after that, hopefully, I will have gotten over my jet lag and I'll be teaching from Yerushalayim, please God. And uh, anyway, yeah, this is the last Shabbos that the vegans are in town. So join us for Shabbos. We'd love to see you. And uh, have a great rest of your week, everybody. Um, no. Oh, oh, two, oh, Bob's asking, will Rabbi Gadi be teaching on Tuesday nights? You mean not Parsha, but in general. So yeah, probably Rabbi Gadi is probably going to be teaching on Tuesday nights, but I think what we're going to do, he's between now and the high holidays, he's going to do a mini series on um, 13 principles of faith. And then we're going to try to get in a couple of guest speakers on Tuesday nights to do preparing for the high holidays. And then um, after the high holidays, um, he's going to plan a new series on Tuesday nights, probably more beginner oriented as a way to try to bring, start bringing in some hopefully some new people. I feel like Parsha Impact is a little bit like higher level. So people might not be able to jump in that haven't been learning. So he's gonna to try to offer some more like intro level classes so we can hopefully try to recruit some new people 
into the uh, classes. So, all right. Thank you, everybody. I, oh, I can unmute you all if you would like, and you can say goodbyes. One second. Thank you. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, have a good night, everybody. I'll see you soon. All right, see you soon. Thanks. Thanks.